We all have different gifts and talents, and that's what makes each one of us important. Today, Pastor Lemon continues the series, Dear Paul. If you'll find your place in your Bible with me this morning at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if this is your first Sunday with us, we have been studying now for 25 weeks through the book of 1 Corinthians, and we find ourselves today in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And we're going to read 11 verses And then we're going to be looking at the entire chapter, at least portions of the entire chapter. So you'll want to keep your Bible open in front of you, and you'll want to be able to follow along some of the other scriptures that I will reference as we talk today about spiritual gifts. Beginning in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you are Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols however you were led. Therefore, I I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one in the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning I pray that you will enable me and empower me to do beyond what I am able to do. And I pray, Lord, that you will speak through me. Lord, I will do my very best to make this text as understandable as possible, but ultimately that's the work of the Holy Spirit to guide us into all the truth. And I pray today, God, that you will guide us. Uh, Father, there are different needs that are represented across this room, and I can't meet all of those needs. Lord, I will not be able to speak to all of those needs, but Lord, you are not as limited. You are not so limited as I am limited. And I pray, Lord God, that you will speak to us even if the message itself isn't the means by which you communicate with our hearts, that you, the Holy Spirit, will speak to us today and cause us to know that we have been in your presence. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There's a man that tells the story about a ranch that's found out in Wyoming, and that ranch is framed by miles and miles of fencing. Not only was that entire spread fenced, this owner, his name was Clyde Peterson, had it subdivided with barbed wire so that he could move his cattle from one section to another section. A single grazing spot on this ranch might be bordered by as many as 600 fence posts. And each cedar post was vitally important to that ranching operation. If even one was knocked down, the entire herd would be able to escape over that fallen section. This same kind of a principle holds true in other areas of life as well. You may have heard of the television personality Mike Rowe. A couple of his programs, How America Works or Dirty Jobs, are programs that I like to watch on occasion. And if you ever do that, you know that sometimes in the process of talking about how America works, he talks about when something happens, something breaks down, and how it causes a problem for the rest of the process. If one machine breaks down, the whole assembly line may grind to a halt. If one screw drops out of a gas carburetor, it will likely run in an erratic fashion. If a single microchip fails, it's possible for the entire computer system to be shut down. 
In other words, whether it's a fence post or a microchip or whether it's a screw in a carburetor or whether it's uh, one of these other pieces of equipment in this long line, this chain of equipment, every piece is important and every part is important. And a local church is no different. Every worker in a church is vital to the ongoing of that church ministry. It may be that you're a life group leader, or you're one of these musicians, or you could be one of the nursery or children's workers, or work in the media ministry, or one of our greeters, or our section hosts, or you might work out on the parking lot, or in security, or in any number of other things that are happening on any given gathering of the people of God. But if any one slacks off, if any one slacks off, the entire effort suffers. In other words, you and I are more than just one more fence post in a long row. You and I are divinely gifted saints of God with a vital role to play in the eternal work of his church. And as a single fence post is crucial to the rancher, every one of us is important to God and to the work of Of the local church. And consequently, what 1 Corinthians begins to unfold for us is this matter of spiritual gifts that God has given to every person in the family of God, every person in a local church. He has given to them a spiritual gift so that they can function within that body in a way that blesses and benefits the body so that the body is strong and the body is vital and the body is healthy so that that body can be a representation of Jesus Christ in the world around us. Today we're going to be talking about spiritual gifts, maybe not in specifically the way that you would like for me to, which is to list all the different gifts and give you definitions of each one and try to help you in some fashion to find that spiritual gift by doing those things. But we're going to look at this in a broader context of the significance of you as a fence post, as a screw in the carburetor, as an individual gifted by God, and how important it is that every person, every person be functioning within the body and every person be serving within the body. In other words, it's not enough just to come to church and sit and to soak because then you sour. You come and you sit and you soak and then you go serve somewhere. That's always been God's intended purpose. And you, if you're a child of the living God, have been gifted for such a task. Now, I want to look at this in five specific ways. So if you're keeping notes, you you can write these down. Spiritual gifts, number one, are special abilities. You notice back to verse one, he says, now concerning, and here's the word, spiritual gifts. Then he says to the brethren, this is not for people who are unsaved. This is to those of us who know Christ. I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to understand what we're talking about when we talk about spiritual gifts. We're talking about, number one, special abilities that God imparts to us as his children. Uh, Dr. John MacArthur, who is a well-known commentator on Scripture, says, a spiritual gift is a channel through which the Holy Spirit ministers to the body. A gift is not an end in itself. I like that definition. I think it's a a good definition, but there's one that I like better. It comes from uh, Dr. Charles Swindoll. He says that spiritual gifts are special skills or abilities that enables each believer to contribute to the whole body of Christ, and notice these words, with ease, pleasure, and effectiveness. I like that. Because when you're functioning according to the spiritual gift that God has given to you, there comes from that an ease and a pleasure and an effectiveness to the work that you're doing. Look back for for a moment, if you will, with me to verse 4, and notice the words that go through here. He says, there are diversities of gifts. The, the, The word is charisma. 
Uh, Charis is the word for grace. These are gifts that are given to us by the grace of God. In verse 5, he says, there are differences of ministries. It's the word diakonia. It's the word from which we get deacon. There are different places of service. And then he says in verse 6, and there are diversities of activities. It's the word energema. There are, there are different things that are wrought. There are different effects. There are different outcomes. But you'll notice that all of it is by the Spirit, the Lord, meaning the Lord Jesus and God. In other words, the Trinity is all mentioned here. All of them are involved such that God gives to us a spiritual gift that's to be used through a ministry, some area of service, and the outcome of that is determined by God. He is the one who decides exactly how he wants to use it and what, to what extent he, he wants to use it. In, in other words, when you're serving in the use of your spiritual gift through a ministry, allowing God to bring about the outcomes that he so desires, what you have found in your spiritual life is what I like to call the sweet spot. Number two, spiritual gifts are sovereignly given. They're sovereignly given. Spiritual gifts aren't something you seek, but God is the one who divinely bestows the gift that he wants you to have. If you look back to chapter 12, verse 6, and you'll notice, he says, and there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. Or if you look down to verse 11, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Or you get down to verse 18, a verse that we have not read, and it says, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. In other words, God is the one who determines what the ability is that we're going to be given. By the way, do you know when you get that ability? It's found in verse 13. He says, for by one spirit, we were all, notice the word all, baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. When were you baptized into the body of Christ? When you trusted Jesus as your Savior. At that moment, the Spirit of God took up residence within you and imparted to you a spiritual gift that he intends for you to use. Now, there's a little bit of confusion about this because you'll hear people talking about, you know, I want this gift and I want that gift and and I'm seeking the gift of tongues and I'm seeking the gift of prophecy and I'm seeking the gift of knowledge and I'm seeking this gift and that gift. Hey, wait a minute. God is the one who determines the gifts we receive. And he does that sovereignly and divinely. If you notice over in verse 31 what it says, chapter 12, verse 31, he says, but earnestly desire the best gifts. You say, Pastor, there it is. He says we're supposed to desire the best gifts. You know, I used to read this passage differently than I do today. I used to understand it differently than I do today. When he says to earnestly desire the best gifts to you realize, and maybe you don't unless you have a footnote in your study Bible, that the words can actually say you are are desiring the best gifts. And in the context of, of Corinth and the church at Corinth where there is so much division and there's conflict amongst them and chaos exists in nearly every corner of the congregation, this is another place where that kind of confrontation, that kind of chaos existed. They wanted specific gifts, especially those that were showy and notable and spectacular. They wanted them because it brought them into the public eye. It made them more noticeable, and it created additional conflict within the congregation. He's not saying, I want you to earnestly desire. He's saying, you are earnestly desiring the the best gifts. But that's not the way gifts work, church. The gifts work by God in his own sovereignty, giving those gifts to you as he so chooses to give those gifts. Number three, spiritual gifts are service-oriented. 
that they're service oriented. In other words, spiritual gifts were never given for self advantage or selfish purposes. If you're using your spiritual gift to get attention for yourself, you're not using it properly. Spiritual gifts are service oriented. Notice, if you will, verse 7, what he says. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Now, notice, for the profit of how many? Of all. For the profit of all. Look at verse 24. But our presentable parts have no need, some say. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that, they should be, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. You get what he's saying? The same care for one another. I want my kidneys to work. I want my heart to pump. I want my lungs to breathe. I want my mind to think. I want my eyes to see and my hands to touch. I want my feet to walk. But I've got all of these different members, and they're all absolutely essential. And they're all for the purpose of serving others. They are service-oriented. We need each other, folks. Okay, so I'll just say it again. We need each other. All of us together make up the whole. And that's the whole point of the argument that comes after the verses that we read in using the body as an illustration of the spiritual gifts that God gives. We all need the different members of the body. We're all necessary to the whole. He says here something that's that's absurd. It's even grotesque. He says here in verse 15, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? Do you get what he's saying? It's service oriented. I don't know what your role in the body of Christ is. Well, some of you I do. But many of you, I don't know what your role is within the body of Christ, but everybody is to be serving God in the use of their spiritual gift through a ministry of a local church, allowing God to give the outcome, God to give the outflow of what he wants. And everybody is to be doing something in the body of Christ. We're all necessary We work together. We're serving each other. We're helping the other. We're not saying, look at me. Together we're saying, look at Jesus. He's the one that makes it all possible. There was a visitor that was being shown around a a leper colony in India. And at noon, a bell sounded for the midday meal. And people came from all parts of the compound to the dining hall, and all at once, laughter filled the air. There in the middle of a bunch of other people were two young men, one riding on the other's back, pretending to be a horse and a rider, and they were having loads of fun. As the visitor watched this unfolding, he was told that the man who carries his friend was blind, and the man who was being carried was crippled. The one who couldn't see used his feet, and the one who couldn't walk used his eyes. But together, they helped each other, and they found great joy in doing it. Imagine a church like that. Just imagine for a moment a church like that. Every member using his or her gift or strength to make up for one another's weaknesses. That's what should be happening in every congregation of believers. Paul compares spiritual gifts to various parts of the human body. Eyes see and ears hear and hands work and feet move the body forward. But all of them are essential. And when each fulfills its function, the whole body benefits. The whole body benefits. Number four, spiritual gifts are spirit-enabled. I'm not going to spend much time here. I've already told you that you receive these gifts 
when you are baptized with the Spirit into the body of Christ, when you trust in Jesus. But you understand that the use of your spiritual gifts, you need the energy of the Spirit of God that indwells you to empower you. It's like putting fuel in your car. Do you watch your gauge, your gas gauge in your car? They're fancy now. They tell you how many miles you got left before you run out of gas. Do you watch the gas gauge and do you stop periodically and refill the tank? That's what in the New Testament is called. Not the baptism with the Spirit. That happens once for all in your life. That's called the filling of the Spirit. Dr. Joseph Thayer is a famous theologian and lexicographer. And he writes about spiritual gifts and their extraordinary powers. This is what he says. They are extraordinary powers distinguishing certain Christians and enabling them to serve the church of Christ. But here's the part I want you to hear. The reception of which is due to the power of divine grace operating in their souls by the Holy Spirit. Operating in their souls by the Holy Spirit. That means that we need the daily, moment by moment, oft-repeated Filling with the Spirit. That's what Ephesians 5 is about. Be filled with the Spirit. To be filled means to be controlled by. Every day we get up and we say, Lord, I want you to use me. Every day we get up and we say, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Control me by your Spirit. Take my gift and use it where it can best be used. By the way, I meant to say it a few moments ago when I'm talking about gifts or a means of serving. Hey, there's a lot of things that you do in the service of God that aren't the sweet spot. Trust me. There's a lot of things that you do that are off-center. They don't fit right on the sweet spot, but you do them because they need to be done, and you can do them even if you don't enjoy doing them. You do them. There's a lot of things in the ministry that I don't really like to do. But you do them anyway. And then you pray for God to give you as many opportunities as possible to do that thing that is your sweet spot. And we give ourselves every single day, oh God, please use me. Please use me today. I surrender myself. If I've got to do something that's not the supernatural gift that you've given to me, that doesn't coordinate with that supernatural gift, Lord, you're going to have to give me extra help and extra assistance to be able to get it done. Number five, spiritual gifts are sorely needed. They are sorely needed. The church today is in need of all of its members doing their part for the greater good of every member of the body in the glorification of God. Let me read it again. This is how I wrote it. The church today is in need of all of its members doing their part for the greater good of every member of the body and the glorification of God. Have you seen all the businesses that have help wanted signs? Have you been into an establishment and had somebody at the establishment say to you, thank you for your patience. We are understaffed today. Can I just tell you that In most churches I know, they are understaffed. They have lots of people sitting, but not nearly as many people serving. But the work of God is extremely hard for a few. A few that are having to do the work that the many should be doing together. Did you get that? The work is hard when the few are having to do the work that the many should be doing together with them. There is no place for us to just sit. Well, pastor, I come. That's my task. I come and I sit. Well, no, you come and sit. That's the filling. That's the refilling. That's the gassing up point. I come to, I come to fill up. But then you go out to serve. You go around the ministry to get involved. You you do something in the service of God. He didn't save you to sit in a pew. 
He saved you to get busy serving him in some capacity. And all across our churches are hanging the help wanted flyers. I don't know much about honeybees. We have people in our church who have honeybees and they love them and they tell me stories about them. And if I get a detail wrong here, you'll forgive me, those of you experts with honeybees. But I'm told that the honeybee has one of the most highly developed social structures in the animal kingdom. At the heart of the hive, which may house as many as 80,000 bees, is the queen. Without her, the colony has no future. Without Jesus, we have no future. But the 80,000 don't just sit around watching their queen. Each bee has a specialized duty to fulfill. The forager bees encounter the perils of the outside world to collect food. The guard bees protect the hive entrance from intruders. The undertakers are responsible for removing dead bodies from the hive. Oh, that'd be a great job. The water collectors bring in moisture to regulate the humidity. The plasterers make a kind of cement to repair the hive. The fanners station themselves at the entrance and fan the scent outward to signal the location of the colony to lost or disoriented bees. The scout bees keep the hive alert to opportunities and dangers of the outside world. I mean, when you just look at a beehive, that honey that you enjoy... And you look at how that beehive operates, it's filled with variety and it's filled with specialization. Everybody has a task. Every bee is working according to that task. That's the way it's supposed to be in a church. The Lord has given special and spiritual gifts and tasks to all of us in his church. And nobody is called to sit around. Everybody has something to do. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this message has made a difference for you. If you would like more information about today's message or more information about Lewis Memorial Baptist Church, don't hesitate to reach out. We would love to hear how this ministry is helping you in your daily walk.